Okay, so today we're going to look at speciation, and to understand speciation, we need to know what a species is. The biological species concept states that two organisms are of the same species if they can mate and bear fertile offspring. And there's limitations to that because it doesn't apply to things that reproduce asexually because they don't need to mate at all. Um, it also can't be used in fossils because we can't tell whether two things could mate and bear fertile offspring. It's hard to watch dead things mate. Um, and many morphologically and ecologically distinct species do have some gene flow. Um, so that classification doesn't work. So you can see here, we've got a polar bear and a grizzly bear, and they can mate and have baby growler bears. So this guy is a growler bear. You can see it has like the nose of a grizzly, um, but the lighter color of a polar bear tempered a bit. Um, we can also talk about a morphological species concept that characterizes organisms by body shape and structural features. It's good because we can apply it to sexually and asexually reproducing species, and it doesn't require any info on gene flow, so we can use it on fossils, but it's subjective. So a lot of insects that were classified morphologically, we realize now when we have better ways of classifying like DNA are actually distinct species. Can also classify based on their ecological niche, so where they live, what they eat, how they um, interact, and so on. Um, so polar bears and grizzly bears, for example, have completely different ecological niches. So it can accommodate sexual and asexual species, but it's difficult to apply to fossils because we don't know exactly what the habitat was like in that point. Um, so the best concept is a phylogenetic species concept. That's where a small group of individuals share a common ancestor, making up one branch of the tree of life. Um, and that takes into account morphology and genetics. So we can use the morphological aspect to classify fossils. We can use genetic aspect, uh, the genetic aspect to classify anything that we can take the DNA from. So this by far is the best. And you can go to this website, the DNA Barcoding Project is, is doing this. I hope you can't hear my kids in the background. They're, they're perfectly happy. It's seven in the morning, they're hungry. Um, we have two different modes of speciation, allopatric and sympatric. Allopatric involves a geographical barrier. Sympatric does not. So by far, allopatric is the most common. And you can see this illustrated here. They're fertilized by um, another tetraploid. So we have a floop in cell division that doubles the chromosome number. They can self-fertilize because they have an even number of chromosomes, or they can meet with any other tetraploids that pop up. Um, but they can't reproduce with their original parent species because, again, that odd number of chromosomes would prevent meiosis from occurring. And we'll watch that animation in class. We can also have sympatric speciation due to habitat differentiation. So here we can see that um, we've got uh, two different species of bee orchids. This species secretes a hormone that attracts one species of bee. This species secretes a hormone that attracts another species of bee. They don't attract the same species of bee, so they can't be fertilized by each other. And we have sexual selection. So here we've got um, a species of chichlid that has a blue back and a species that has a, an orange back male. Um, the females of this species prefer the blue back. The females of this species prefer the orange back. If we keep them under monochromatic light so they can't tell whether they're blue or orange, the females will actually selected, selectively pick neither, um, which shows that really all that's keeping those species uh, genetically distinct is the female's mate selection. I think this is where the next slide picked up. If it's not, we're just going to jump around and you're not going to care. Whether it's a blue back or an orange back, so they tend to, they're tending to merge into one species. Same with polar bears, as uh, climate change causes the Arctic sea ice to melt, polar bears can't hunt as far into the water, so they tend to hunt uh, more on land. Their habitat then begins to overlap with that of the grizzly bears, and uh, they can come in contact and mate, so we get more and more of these growler bears. Um, but the tendency by far in a hybrid zone is stability, so we've got a relatively constant rate of hybrids in a very, very narrow zone. Uh, adaptive radiation is the tendency of species to diversify into many different ones adapted from a common ancestor. So we can see Darwin's finches here. Common ancestor would have come from South America um, or from the islands before they diverged from South America, and the different things they eat, leaves, buds, grubs, 
uh, whether they use tools to find their food or whether they eat insects means they all have differentially adapted beaks. Um, and that's really common and easy to see on island chains where each island might have its diverse habitat. So you can see that the uh, species are uniquely adapted to their environment. So there's two tempos of speciation, uh, gradualism and punctuated equilibrium. Gradualism implies that there's a slow divergence over time, um, whereas punctuated equilibrium implies that that actual divergence happens quite quickly and then the species remains relatively constant for the remainder of its uh, existence.